Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Bridges, mass transit, the cost of gas, interstate construction, community development and design, lifestyles. There are so many things directly related to how we manage state and local formal transportation plans. Welcome again and thanks for supporting the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy dialogue seen each week and every market in North and South Carolina for 25 years. I am Chris William and this time it's North Carolina DOT chief while in the top job for just a year he has been embedded in the Department of Transportation and the Tar Heel State's plans for transit for years. In a moment an extended dialogue with this also former mayor of Durham, the Honorable North Carolina Secretary of Transportation, Nick Tennyson. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services and by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring special guest Nicholas J. Tennyson, North Carolina Secretary of Transportation. Hello, happy summer, and welcome again to our program, Your Honor. Uh, Secretary Tennyson, good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, Your Honor, we, you know, we, we drive around the Carolinas in the summer, and the traffic patterns have changed in some of the metros, yeah. but also going down to the beach into the mountains and you know, I-95 and the major corridors. It, 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 it seems like over the last two or three years, there's been a dramatic increase in congestion and traffic and stop and go. Uh, do you think, it, this might not be the right way to ask it, but do you think we'll ever be able to get back in front of where we need to be in building out and be re, uh, proactive and not reactive to transportation and planning? I, I know we need to, and, and Governor McCrory has made that clear, that, that that's what he believes we need to do, and he's pointed that out all the time, is that when you realize you have a problem, it's, it's later than it should be to try to address it. So. So I, I'm, I'm not as optimistic that, that there's enough funding to, to really get in front of uh, the, the infrastructure challenge. I say frequently that the only major piece of infrastructure I've ever seen built before it was needed was Dulles Airport in D.C. I mean, all the rest of it, we wait until we really need it before we are able to build it. On the other hand, there are things that the governors ask us to do and that the legislature's allowed us to do that have put us in a position of trying to be more efficient about allocating those resources and to try to focus on, on where we really do have the major challenges. The, the part about the congestion, as it happens, is a part of being a growing state with a vibrant economy. And I have to tell you, that while these are challenges, they're much better than the challenges of states mm. where they're losing population. High class problems to have. So when you're, when you're sitting in a traffic jam, <laughs> what do you think? Do you think, you know, do you pick up the phone and you call a department head and say, yeah, right. <laughs> what's going on here? No, I, I, I have to tell you that, that, that that's uh, an experience that I have daily uh, when I commute uh, to Raleigh. Um, I live in Durham, got an I-40, um, and that's been a, a part of the, the training I had before I got into this job, I think, uh, in a sense, because uh, we joke and we say that, that every uh, driver's license is issued on the back of it it says license to be a traffic engineer because we're all immediately qualified but 
But I, I used to see traffic backed up on Highway 54 between Chapel Hill to our mm -hmm. west and Raleigh, bumper to bumper, commuting to the Research Triangle Park. And we, we built I-40 and suddenly 54 was a free flow corridor mm -hmm. and 40 was serving all the traffic. And then, uh-oh, it filled back up. And we ended up being in stop and go traffic on both 40 and 54. Then we added a lane to 40. Great. A few years later, fills back up. Mm -hmm. So the, the question of, of dealing with um, a, a dynamic situation like economic growth and the Research Triangle Park being a wonderful resource to the state, UNC hospitals, mm -hmm. wonderful resource to the state, um, dealing with that dynamic situation with something that takes as long to plan and execute as, as major infrastructure is a real challenge. What, what, what do you think, Mr. Secretary, is the most misunderstood thing? Maybe it's about DOT, maybe it's about the funding formula, but just in general, when people are sitting in their cars or looking at it, do they, do they not look at it holistically? Well, <laughs> uh, no, nobody does that. I mean, and, and not about any challenge. We all are focused on how we're experiencing life at any given moment. I mean, I, from sports teams to, to anything that you're doing, you're thinking about what it is that's important to you at that moment. And that, in the case of a commute or a trip to the beach or to go see the leaves, all those things are focused in the moment, and, and unfortunately, they can't be dealt with in the moment. They are challenges that have to be dealt with over time. So when the governor was elected, one of the first things that he said we need to do is make sure that the funds we have are being allocated in a way that responds to the demands we have. So the funding formula got changed, mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it did a great job of creating the opportunity for more jobs to be created by picking projects that were higher up in, a, in an objective scoring system. Um, and and we, we move ahead with that, but, but ultimately, I have to tell you, a lot of congestion shows up because somebody wasn't paying attention and ran into the back of somebody else's car, mm -hmm. or in some other way uh, disrupts the flow of the travel. I, if, if everybody would slow down 10 miles an hour, we'd go faster. If we would go through those choke points mm -hmm. and everybody would instead, instead of trying to go 65 and weave, if you went to 45, we'd put more cars through those choke points. Is that, is that, a, is that a function of the state police or the local authorities? No, it's a function of we've got human beings. And, yeah. and that's at, at some level, and I don't want to go too far into the autonomous vehicle question, but, but we're dealing with human beings. But, but back to this question about what's misunderstood about DOT. I think there's the sense that we don't plan or realize what's out there. And we have plans. You mean we the actually, DOT doesn't plan right, or realize? The, we, okay. the public agencies, and DOT in, in particular, somehow has missed the idea that there are actually cars out there on the road. And we are keenly aware of that, and we do plans. And then the question becomes, how do you fund those plans? And I think one of the things that uh, people are confused about is uh, where is the federal government in this? Is there money that's coming from the federal government? Do they maintain, does they, does they maintain mm -hmm. interstate highways? No, that's just a part of the state highway system. And when we get federal funding, it is because our citizens have paid a federal fuel tax. We spend the money to build the project and then we get reimbursed. So it isn't like we get a big check at the beginning of the year and, and allocate it. And lately, that's not been a check we could count on. The federal funding stream has been very iffy. Um, there were dozens of temporary extensions before we finally got the most recent long-term bill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're in that environment uh, and when you're using some um, questionable, in my view, uh, ways to pay for transportation that are not necessarily as reliable long term, you get into a real challenge about making those decisions. And finally, one of the things that I don't think people understand is scale. North Carolina has the second largest state maintained highway system in the country second to Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas has a very large county, large county system, county road system, but we have no county roads in North Carolina. We don't fund any of our state highway system through property tax, which is what's done in almost all the other states. But that's pushed down to the counties. 
that. Right, and so so of the 80,000 miles that we have under our maintenance, 60,000 miles in other states, almost all the other states, would be maintained by, at the county level. We don't do that. So, so when we have this very large system and the scale of what we do, um, people think of a billion dollars as a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But when you have a 100 county state mm -hmm. and a mile of two lane road costs you $4 million, which it does on a low bid, that isn't something we, we think up. Um, that's only two and a half miles per county per year that you can add to the system. And let me just tell you, we're not, we're not funded at a level to meet very many of the demands uh, and not to be out in front mm -hmm. of them as much as we'd like to. So, so is, the, is the funding for county, state, local highways, is, that, is, the, is the ideas for funding have been pretty much picked over through uh, federal funding or the lack of federal funding and, and ways to either raise or lower a gas tax or go out and, and get some public debt. Hi, do toll roads, are toll, besides the fact that when the, the, the word toll road or the, the, the phrase toll road is said becomes a, a, a you know, politically polarizing. Are we missing an opportunity to develop toll roads further? Uh, we're, we're missing an opportunity to understand that we can't rely on the previous funding mechanism. Uh, the first North Carolina gas tax was passed in 1921. It was a penny a gallon, and it maintained an 8,000 mile system of highways. We now have 80,000 miles. That penny adjusted for inflation would be 13 cents, so mm -hmm. starting with that. Um, and when you've got a funding mechanism that lasted for 100 years, you should congratulate yourself and start looking for other alternatives because the fuel economy that cars have today has thrown out of whack completely the, the demand and supply or demand mm -hmm. and resource equation. We are getting much more uh, mileage out of each gallon on which we're paying fuel tax, and that means we're having to maintain more vehicle capacity for the same revenue from that source. Now, again, North Carolina has been in a great situation compared to a lot of states because in 1986, the legislature indexed our fuel tax and, and made it move with the, some of the major underlying costs mm -hmm. of, causes of our cost the pegged to the uh, wholesale price of gasoline at that time. And so therefore, when the cost, and, and a lot of us remember the, the cost of construction and pavement and everything else going up radically. Uh, as that went up, our fuel tax went up, so we have been better off than, al than almost all the other states mm -hmm. in terms of being able to keep up with some of the maintenance challenges. And by the way, again, we focused on construction and thinking about tolls. That wouldn't do anything for our maintenance challenge. That 80,000 miles of roadway we've got, mm -hmm. That's not going anywhere. We're not going to turn any of it back into gravel. So we're going to need to maintain that. And so as we look forward, thinking through the question of how do you handle the, the, the funding of what is functionally a peak hour utility? And, and by that I mean we don't build the number of lanes that we need at 2 in the morning. We build the number of lanes that are needed at the peak hour. So that's the most expensive work that we do mm -hmm. is building that peak hour capacity. The right of way is crazy expensive. Most of the places we're building are in the highest cost areas. Most of the time we're adding on to things where the easy lanes have already been put in. And so when you have that capacity created, there aren't very many utilities I know that have functioned on a flat rate charge mm -hmm. for a peak hour uh, mm -hmm. consumption. And, and we're going to have to analyze this going forward as to how we can handle it because uh, all the underlying assumptions on transportation have been changing radically, especially in the last 20 years. Well, and, and as you said, even before the program, with the in-migration and the growth of the Carolinas, it's a high-class problem to have. It, it, are we missing a pretty dramatic, and these are my words, a pretty dramatic opportunity by not developing rail and more mass transit with the flattening of the use of mass transit in the last decade or so? How do we make that a politically popular decision? Well, I, I, let, let me just make sure that we're focused on rail in the, in the broadest sense of that. And I, I have to tell you, we've just had a huge, huge success in the Rocky Mount area in Edgecombe mm -hmm. County with the new SX, CSX intermodal connector. And this is, this is freight, right? That, that's for freight, but freight, every, the, all trains use the same rails. 
I mean, it, uh, when we're talking about inner city connection or, or commuter rail kinds of, um, and, and frankly, when you build a light rail, if it's anywhere near a, a heavy rail corridor, there are interrelationships mm -hmm. there you have to take into account. So that, that uh, intermodal connector will take 280 trucks off the road for every train that goes out of that, that facility. Thousands of trucks, truck trips that are gonna be avoided as a result of having that freight rail development. So we've been focused on making sure that we're moving freight rail for both its economic development benefit and for relief on the roads because all of us know that the truck traffic that we deal with is, is huge. And when we go uh, into passenger rail, we have to deal with the question of uh, how willing people are to invest in an infrastructure system that cannot recover all the costs that are mm -hmm. charged to the passengers. There are no rail systems for passengers that do full recovery of the cost of operation with very few exceptions in the Northeast Corridor in the United States. So again, this is a public utility. It's a, it's a, it's a question, and, and this comes back to the way we fund infrastructure, the way we fund transportation. We have been on a user fee basis for forever. We've assumed that we can charge you the driver for your driver's license, for the license on your car, for your fuel, and we will use those funds and those funds only to, to do transportation. I think most of us understand now that it's all transportation. So in other words, we don't want to just have highways. We want to have seaports. We've got mm -hmm. two very strong assets there. We want to have a strong aviation community. My friends on the coast would, would uh, throw a major um, objection into the ring if I didn't say that we've got a ferry system that we have to maintain on the coast. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've also got bicycle and pedestrian systems that we want to maintain. So all of those things are demands on a transportation system and transportation funding source that's focused on uh, motor fuels tax and the use of automobiles. We, the transportation system unquestionably has a major effect on the general economy of the state. And there are some other states that have used general fund uh, mm -hmm. sources to help do transportation. I'm not here proposing that. I'm just saying as you think about how we have done it in the past, how we want to do it in the future, that there are a lot of different ways that people are trying to think mm -hmm. through this. Even, even in light of the general, North Carolina General Assembly's recent um, uh, policy that they put in, in law, they put in place around the, what I'm calling the progressive, smart, if you will, fuel tax that goes down but then slightly goes back up, even in light of, of, of a thoughtful fuel tax. Are, are we underweighting what we could raise in revenue from increasing gas tax, even, even by two or three cents above what, what we think is going to happen well, there? Well, uh, just to give you and anyone else that wants to have this metric, uh, every penny of the gas tax in North Carolina results in $50 million every year for revenue. So if you said two million or two cents on the tax, you'd say a hundred million dollars, um, which is a rounding error on your budget. Well, it it, it is a lot of money, <laughs> but again, at four million dollars per mile, you know when you when you've got a hundred million dollars, you've got twenty five miles of road you just paid for, and that's just for a two lane road. A hundred million dollars, um, as it happens in a developed state with with a successful economy. Uh, is, a, is a small incremental addition for which we would be appreciative and which we would use to the best of our abilities to deliver the service. But the scale is not there. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are at a point where the, the last plan that was, that was done for the Department of Transportation in 2012, looking forward, said that there was about a, a billion dollar uh, difference between what was needed to, to gain ground, mm -hmm. to gain, not just to hold where we are, but to gain ground on our challenge of providing infrastructure, not to put everybody in free flow traffic, frankly, but to, but to gain some ground. And that study's been replicated in several different iterations uh, about that same scale. So, you know, if we proposed a single source for that revenue, we'd find ourselves with the problem that I just mm -hmm. identified, which is that that source is becoming less productive. And so I'm not advocating that we pay for it or come up with a, a one source, because beyond that, the, the places that we 
need to use that money are different. Mm -hmm. the, Governor McCrory put out a 25-year transportation vision that I think very clearly makes the case that one size fits all isn't the answer that we need to make sure that we're aware that there are different needs and demands in the coastal part of North Carolina, mm -hmm. the Piedmont, the near coastal, the mountains, and that $4 million a mile thing, by the way, doesn't apply to Silva or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So, so we're, we're in a position where we, uh, I believe, have been having some good conversations as a, as a public. Uh, I, I hope that the general public will get engaged and, and try to understand exactly uh, where all these things are pressure points and and get beyond just the question of what's my commute uh, about mm -hmm. but it, but that's that's really a big ask people have a lot of things on their mind so so mr secretary and you know i don't, I don't want to make this tabloidy but but it does make there are some people mad as hornets when it comes down to north carolina and where north carolina is now in its brand hb2 the voter id uh, issue that's recently been overturned by a, by a circuit court, Amendment 1 or whatever. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but how much harder do those social debates, um, even even in the North Quarter, I-77 in Charlotte, how folks thought that their uh, that the opponents to the, the toll roads in I-77 thought that was a there was a malevolent effort by DOT to get that stuff rammed through. And I'm not asking you to to defend this, but does do those kind of headlines? make your job harder, make it harder to, to get everyone around a DOT plan that's, that's good for the entire state. Well, there is no one who's ever served in a public capacity who can't cite an example where a headline or coverage of an issue will have, let's just say, distorted the, the, the conditions that are being presented and are attempted to be solved, but, um, we have the, the benefit at the Department of Transportation in, for the most part, having a tangible product. And, and I have to tell you that I, I do not envy a lot of my colleagues in the cabinet who are dealing with things like the, uh, just the sense of public safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no tangible way to exactly measure the outcome of the education system in the sense of each person. You can tell if we've got that road in there. And furthermore, you can tell if there's a pothole in it and you're telling us. And I hope people do that because that is the thing that we're trying to make sure that we get across. With an 80,000 mile system, it's not because we don't want to know that there's a problem that we've got there. We've got a new NCDOT slash contact, if you use your smartphone, that you're able to tell us about the various issues that are out there. Mm -hmm debris or, or an issue with a guardrail, things like that. Um, so we have an advantage because, because we're proving it to you every day and you either are happy or not happy. In the bigger issues of how are we gonna fund it, how are we gonna face the future, how are we gonna be a 21st century state and maintain, at least I believe we still have, that good roads feel, how are we gonna do that? I think those bigger issues are going to take a little bit of a suspension of that um, very small mm -hmm. turf attitude that, that sometimes comes mm -hmm. into play. And again, I'm I'm not saying that's a small thing to ask. If it, we've got about a minute left, if if uh, the, the the headwind of politics wasn't an issue, and I know that's never going to be a case, but if it were not an issue, how would you propose funding DOT differently? Um, it, it, that's. I think you can appreciate that if I proposed anything right now, it wouldn't be uh, something that I could necessarily trot out and claim full force and effect. But I, I, think, I think the way we need to, to do it is to be able to, to come up with a system, to modify our system, to be more reflective of that difference in demand and need that, that's across the state, and to make sure that as we fund it, that we are looking with clear eyes at the ways that it, transportation affects general quality of life and possibilities of success and, mm -hmm. and try to bring it in line. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, thanks for being on the program. It's a pleasure. Thanks for leading at a, at a difficult time and uh, thanks for making sure the roads are safe. Mm -hmm. Number one priority. Safe travels. Thank uh, you. Back. Uh, thank you for watching our program. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please take time. Go to carolinabusinessreview.org uh, and make your comments or your suggestions. We always do appreciate that. And thank you for supporting this program. Until uh, next week, I'm Chris William. Hope your week and your summer are well. Good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.